So again, this, this final grand challenge is certainly about exploration, discovery, and having a lot of fun. But it's also about technology abstraction. And we saw even the latest sensor technology is used for gaming. Graphical system design can take advantage of that. We saw cloud and mobile technologies. And we've seen all kinds of different applications of FPGA and advanced control capabilities. And really, the way that we're able to deli deliver this kind of technology to you is through some of our critical technology partners. And with that, I'm really excited to introduce to the stage the Senior Vice President of Global Worldwide Marketing and Business Development, Vin Radford from Xilinx, as well as our own Director of LabVIEW R&D, David Fuller. <laughs> Welcome, guys. Vin, thank you so much for joining us on stage. Thank you, Shelley. On behalf of Xilinx, we're very excited to be a part of your NI Week conference. You know, it's fascinating to see how NI is helping scientists and engineers address so many important problems beyond the realm of traditional electronic systems. Applications that cross over and are multidisciplinary, like medicine, transportation, and clean energy, to name a few. As a close partner with NI, Xilinx has been working hard to keep up with the demands of these new applications, leveraging Moore's Law and a host of others, like driver assistance that helps drivers spot road signs, avoid accidents, and save lives, intelligent security cameras that help keep us safe, and industrial control to help build robots that have the manual dexterity of humans. These are all examples that push the bounds of traditional embedded systems. What they have in common is the need for very high performance image processing and real-time data processing while keeping the cost and the power consumption low. To address these applications, you need a true crossover platform that combines the software programmability of an embedded processor with the hardware flexibility of an FPJ while leveraging the single chip integration of a system on a chip. We call this new device family Zinc. Let's have a look under the covers. The first thing you'll notice is that Zinc includes a complete ARM processing system with the most advanced multi-core processor available from ARM today. It's a dual Cortex A9 core that runs up to 800 megahertz along with dedicated level one caches, memory controllers, and a whole full suite of peripherals. All of this functionality is available at power up and that means you can start running LabVIEW code for the processor on day one. Now the processing subsystem is very tightly integrated with our most advanced 28 nanometer programmable logic, which can be used to build custom accelerators and extend the functionality of the processor for your application. And unlike today's two chip solutions, there are more than 3,000 interconnects between the processor and the fabric, and they're all on chip giving you the lowest latency, highest bandwidth connections possible. For those of you that need all the performance you can get, you'll appreciate the massive bandwidth that Zinc offers. And if you don't even need the speed, you'll still appreciate that Zinc makes your design job easier because you can ignore the fundamental delays between the processor and the FPJ fabric. Last but not least is Zinc's flexible external I.O. that lets you get data on and off the chip in a variety of ways. It's got integrated serial transceivers with line rates up to 12 and a half gigabits per second. It can handle standards like PCIe, PCIe Gen 2, and it's got a dual multi-channel A to D for system temperature and voltage sensing and other analog inputs. When you combine all this functionality with the LabVIEW design environment, we believe great things will happen. You'll have a powerful rapid innovation platform that will let you focus on solving the world's toughest engineering problems, while NI and Xilinx technology take care of most of the implementation details. Mm. Now, <laughs> as Jeff mentioned this morning, we'll show you an example of a demonstration of the two technologies coming together. And Vin, we couldn't agree more. You've seen what they're able to do with the technology today. Imagine what they can do with zinc inside of our products. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Now to give you a sneak peek at some of the future system design tools that could take advantage of technologies like Zinc, 
No one better to give us that demonstration than our own David Fuller. Thanks, Shelley. So I'm going to start a little bit by showing you why we're so excited about zinc. You can see that it has these two ARM A9 cores and an FPGA fabric that's a perfect fit for LabVIEW real-time, LabVIEW FPGA, and NI Rio. Now, you can certainly see that it's such a good fit that you might see it in a lot of our future hardware that might okay. look a little something like this. David, I was using this as kind of my master control for driving the whole keynote. Are you also running Ajax or Flash or some kind of cool technology? Uh, no, this isn't a mock-up in PowerPoint. This is an under-development, next-generation, multi-touch editor that we have some very, very talented folks back in the lab working on. It's running on a Windows 7 PC, projecting onto the monitors you see above me, but more importantly, it's projecting onto this 55-inch frosted glass display, which is multi-touch enabled with optical sensors arrayed along the edge of it. So now when Jeff Kay was giving his introductory keynote and he was talking about bringing hardware more front and center, I'd like to start by showing you some hardware front and center. Uh, we have a PXI chassis, uh, and you can drill into this PXI chassis and explore your hardware system. Now we've long talked about the power through hierarchy of VIs and looking at different levels of abstraction, and we feel like you ought to be able to do the same thing as you're learning and exploring your hardware. So I'm going to drill into this PXI chassis. You can do it one more time. OK, it's yeah. pretty cool. I just like to watch it. You like it? OK, it's good. Go ahead. All right, zoom back in. Thanks. And you can drill in and have at your fingertips, in a manner that you would expect, information about your hardware ranging from its block diagrams to that great zinc chip inside of it. And you can explore this information ranging from just learning about it, the hardware capabilities to basic system help and pinouts to photorealistic images. So certainly the few, go ahead. So we feel pretty strongly that we've done a pretty great job of integrating software in a graphical methodology, but we really do have to address the gap of having the hardware with it so we can deliver on the yen and yang of hardware software in combination. Now I'm going to transfer over here away from this particular hardware perspective to what we're calling a top-level system diagram. Now these are the kind of diagrams that we all create for these presentations using tools like PowerPoint or Visio or whatever. We feel they're kind of suboptimal, and not because they're inherently bad at creating diagrams, but it's really, really inefficient to have a communication tool for describing your system completely decoupled from your application design and implementation environment. So this particular system diagram is showing an electric car charging system. And we can explore it a little bit and say, OK, I have a smart grid. And hopefully, through some of the work of the great folks that were on stage here, all grids in the future will be smart. I'm pulling my energy off of that into a charging dock, which I could then kind of explore and drill into. So we feel like hierarchy needs to be present in every form of diagram that you have. So I'm pulling energy off the grid, taking it in my charger, pushing it into my car. Now I'd like to thank one of our more green engineers at NI for allowing us to take a picture of his new, very trendy car. The guy that did Smartville yesterday? That's his yeah. So now we have an ECU prototype implemented with that PXI hardware I was showing you earlier. And it's em emulating the ECU of the test vehicle so that you can develop your charging dock without really you know, blowing up your car. Then you can take both of those systems and shovel the data into a data cloud that Mike was showing you earlier. And then you can use your ubiquitous mobile computing device, your handheld or your web browser or whatever, to look at that data. And we feel like this is exactly the kind of communication tool that needs to be well integrated into the future tools of scientific discovery so your applications can scale. So now I want to move over to a different view or lens into your system. And we're calling this an architectural diagram. Now this isn't as much about communicating to others specifically the high level elements of your system. It's more to get you to focus in on the functional capabilities from an architectural point of view about your application. So for this particular view, we have what is a more or less a whiteboard metaphor. And in black, I have a, a representation of what all of the software actors in the system are trying to do for my car charging system. And in blue, I have the hardware capabilities. Now again, similar to the communication using the documentation tool view I was talking about earlier, we see that engineers tend to skip this step. And I believe and we believe that it's because it's, again, decoupled from their implementation flow. So we really want to work and focus on making you able to design these architectures and have them scale with the true complexity of the problems you've seen presented here today. And in order to do that, the architectural design phase and the requirement specification phase have to be fully and completely integrated into your natural design flow. Now, you see me clicking through these various uh, layouts and views of your system, and I want to talk a little bit about graph theory, auto routing, and layout. Not into the full technical details, but one of the trade offs when we look at using these graphical metaphors for representing system state is that you, as a developer, end up dropping blocks and placing them down and wiring stuff. 
And that's a little bit of a productivity hiccup that we think we can address through better auto routing and auto layout. We did uh, a, little, a little bit of that today, right, David? Last year we showed um, block diagram cleanup, where we do some auto routing and cleanup of your wires diagrams. Yeah, absolutely. So the team that developed those graphing algorithms that did the diagram cleanup tool really laid the foundation in our thinking that the future tools of tomorrow can really do a much better job of automatically laying these things out. Certainly, you can still maintain direct control and specify exactly where you want everything, but getting started and rapidly developing your application and switching between these views, the editor itself ought to handle that job. So now I'm going to transition over to what I consider to be one of the most important views that an engineer needs into their overall system. And we're calling this an implementation diagram. And from one single view, I can see three key aspects of my system. Uh, you can see in the particular white shades, I have all of what we call processing elements in my system. And certainly, a major trend, an obvious trend in computing is heterogeneous computing targets. So in this one simple car charging application I've showed you today, I've got stuff running on the cloud with some web services shown in green. I've got a mobile platform. Who knows what processing subsystems are on that? And then I have the real-time controllers and FPGAs from National Instruments. Now, in a glance, I can see all of that, and I can see where all of my code is running. And then critically, I can see the data communication relationships between them, whether it's using standard live view data flow or a more asynchronous methodology. Now, we believe that the hierarchy we've shown in all of these different views is critical, and each one of them should have its own form of it. So I'm going to drill in on this particular implementation diagram and get a little more details on Zinc. And so you can see in place, again, leveraging these automatic layout algorithms, I expanded my Zinc based Flex Rio to show the dual core processors, which is running a monitoring subsystem, and then some of the FPGA fabric. And you can see I have this purple node here highlighted, which says PID, which is part of my controlling algorithm. Now, I'm going to take a look at the implementation of that PID. It's in purple because it's a VHDL implementation of a PID algorithm. Now, we've long talked about models of computation, and Jeff alluded to it in his keynote. And in this particular view, I have a thumbnail of possible models of computation that I can view my particular PID algorithm in. Now, it's implemented in VHDL, and Jeff in his keynote talked about our major investment in our compiler infrastructure, where we funnel all of these models of computation into an intermediate representation called DEFER. Now, we also have back in the labs a pretty cool implementation of the ability to take DEFER and synthesize back out another diagram. And so that's really just a fancy way of saying I can take my VHDL algorithm, shovel it through DEFER, and generate a more preferred model of computation, perhaps LabVIEW. I think so, that, yeah. <laughs> And I think that's a really important point. I mean, this models of computation concept is not only your preference, so choose the language of your preference, but also the right language for the job. We've seen a bunch of different applications where um, math or .m files versus G pro data flow programming, you're going to be able to choose the right language to do whatever application you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of the speakers last night at the Graphical System Design Awards ha had a great point. It, the models of computation are really about the democratization of the language so that you can use the language of your choice mm -hmm. for the problem of your choice. So I'm going to, now that I have it as G, I'm going to kind of drill into it, and we'll look at the diagram of the future. Looks kind of like the diagram of today. Very comfortable. I think we have a pretty good thing in place when we're talking about LabVIEW and how it represents a graphical programming language. Now, Jeff also mentioned that 25 years ago with the birth of LabVIEW, we also had the birth of the random number to strip chart demo. So I can think of nothing better to show the future of LabVIEW for the next 25 years by doing that same demo. So we'll go ahead and draw that out. I'm going to draw my while loop. Come on, that's awesome. <laughs> I'll draw my chart. We're just drawing a random number and wiring it. And right. I'll draw my wire up. Okay. So, so if you take one thing away from today's demo, it, it is that LabVIEW is the most powerful touch-ready language on the planet. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Not to harsh too much on text-based programming, but it's not like a touch-based text keyboard is a huge productivity improvement for text-based languages. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to end by saying that the LabVIEW team, which is just a scooch larger than the original LabVIEW 1 team, <laughs> has embraced the audacious vision that Jeff Kay and Dr. T have put in front of us. And we would really, really like to thank you for all of the inspiration that you give us by the problems that you're solving today 
and the problems that we know you're going to solve in the future. So thank you so much. Thank you, David.